A swordfish rises from black Pacific waters, hauled under deck lights, flash frozen within hours, then shipped across oceans, still fresh enough to melt on the tongue in Tokyo or Naples. Under a pale moon in the South Atlantic, the deck rocks with the weight of the ocean's pulse. A crewman in rubber boots holds a thick line hand over hand, guiding a metallic shadow into view. The swordfish arrives not with elegance but impact, thudding onto the metal floor, eyes wide, gills pulsing. Within minutes, it's bled with precision, washed in chilled seawater and lowered into an ice slurry that drops its surface temperature below zero. The speed of this first phase isn't just habit, it's science. Flesh begins to soften as soon as the heart stops. Delay by half an hour, and the fish loses its firmness, its brightness, its market price. What happens next is a race not across distance, but against the microscopic clock of decay. These long liners operate across the equator, some hauling in dozens of fish per night, others landing hundreds by dawn. Each catch is weighed, tagged, and stowed into blast freezers that roar at minus 40 degrees. From here, a network unfolds, small ports like Manta and Victoria, or industrial hubs in Spain and Taiwan. Swordfish must leave the tropics before heat reclaims it. Once ashore, forklifts load pallets into reefer trucks, whose thermostats are tracked by satellite. A single delay, a flat tire, a power flicker, can warm the cargo enough to lose certification. And without certification, there's no sale. But freshness isn't the only challenge. Swordfish are regulated under tight quotas, with catch documentation required at every checkpoint. Electronic logs, handwritten manifests, and barcoded labels all confirm legality, origin, and root. Inspectors at port facilities open random containers, slice through packaging, and test the meat. They're looking for the temperature drift, signs of fraud, and even hints of spoilage gas. If even a trace of ammonia is found, the whole batch may be destroyed. Meanwhile, demand never pauses. Markets in Rome expect swordfish loins by Wednesday. Seoul's wholesalers require steak cuts by Thursday morning. From landing dock to retail icebox, the window is narrow, often just three days. So fish that fed in the wild just days ago now hum across the sky in air cargo holds, packed in thermal blankets and vacuum insulation. Each crate is labeled not just by weight, but by species, code, landing date, and flight route. In some airports, fish shipments have priority over electronics and pharmaceuticals. Why? Because swordfish has a clock inside it, and that clock is always ticking. In the controlled chill of a distribution hub outside Rotterdam, steel doors hiss open to reveal crates lined in condensation, each marked with black stenciled codes and soft beads of frost. Workers in fleece-lined overalls move deliberately across the concrete floor, guiding pallets of swordfish toward processing rooms that hum with fluorescent light and rhythmic mechanical whirring. Some of these fish were caught just three days ago in the waters off the Azores. Others in the deep Pacific off Chile, miles apart, oceans apart, but all arriving within a narrow temperature range, all within the fragile window where wild flavor can be preserved without compromise. Each crate carries more than protein. It holds pressure to deliver on quality, legality, and traceability without the slightest break in the chain. The system is vast, but not impersonal. In one corner of the facility, a worker slides a long, sharp blade into the spine of a partially thawed swordfish loin, checking color and texture against internal standards. It's not just visual, it's tactile. Too soft, and the muscle structure has begun to collapse. Too dark, and the internal temperature likely spiked in transit. At another table, vacuum-packed loins are passed through a metal detector to flag fragments of hooks or cutting blades. Precision is built into every step, not just to maintain food safety, but to meet consumer expectations in cities where chefs will reject an entire shipment for a slight variance in hue. Above this quiet urgency, data systems record each action. A scanned QR code links to the vessel that caught the fish. The date it was frozen 
and the batch of coolant packs used in the shipping crate. This data trail travels with the product as it's sorted, labeled, and prepped for air or road transport. In high-volume hubs like Miami and Singapore, this flow of information is automated. Conveyor belts equipped with optical readers sort swordfish fillets by size, grade, and even destination. In some facilities, artificial intelligence monitors surface temperature and moisture in real time, flagging inconsistencies before human eyes could detect them. The swordfish moves not just through physical space, but through a layered net of digital scrutiny. This also means the swordfish you see at a delicatessen in Madrid may have been handled by over 20 people before arrival, each one responsible for a different stage of preservation. One employee in a Sri Lankan port affixes the initial barcode. Another in a processing plant near Valencia trims the fillet's edges and wraps it in breathable, food-safe plastic. A logistics coordinator in Paris monitors the temperature data coming from onboard sensors as the shipment crosses the Pyrenees in a reefer truck. And in Los Angeles, an importer opens the crate and smells for freshness before passing the product to a wholesaler. The swordfish, still cold enough to release no odor, is accepted, weighed, and sent forward again. Amid all this, the cold itself becomes an instrument of control. Unlike many products that rely on visual appeal or brand recognition, swordfish is judged most critically by what cannot be seen. Slight warming over time results in histamine buildup, a biological trigger for rejection in markets like the EU and Japan. This is why many shipping companies now deploy thermal recorders the size of a postage stamp inside each crate. These record temperature readings every 15 minutes and transmit them by RFID or satellite when scanned. If a crate logs a fluctuation beyond set tolerances, it's flagged, often before it reaches inspection. In certain cases, entire containers are rerouted to lower tier markets where standards are less stringent or discarded altogether. Even the packaging is an evolving science. Traditional styrofoam, though effective, is being phased out in many regions for more sustainable alternatives. Sugarcane pulp molded into thick insulated panels. Hemp fiber boxes lined with biodegradable film. Vacuum liners that use plant-based polymers designed to break down without releasing toxins. These packaging materials must withstand both freezing temperatures and the bruising movement of international freight. They're engineered to hold their form inside an airplane cargo bay at 38,000 feet, and again as they re-offloaded in a humid portside warehouse where exterior conditions can top 40 degrees Celsius. On the docks of Port Klang, Malaysia, workers offload containers under sodium lights that paint everything in amber. Here, swordfish arrives boxed in pallets stacked six high, each unit weighed and tallied against import manifests. Government inspectors open random shipments, probing not just legality, but species verification, ensuring the fish inside is, in fact, swordfish and not mislabeled billfish or juvenile tuna. DNA testing has become routine in some regions, an added layer in a trade where substitution can yield major profits. The need for verification rises as markets demand premium cuts and tighter ecological sourcing. Even the ice packs are sampled for chemical consistency to ensure coolant gels are non-toxic and environmentally safe in case of leakage. What appears to be a frozen slab to the untrained eye is actually the final product of intersecting global systems, each designed to preserve a fleeting freshness that begins slipping away the instant a fish is pulled from the sea. It's not simply about cold. It's about consistency, timing, and clarity. If a crate of swordfish leaves a port in Costa Rica and arrives in Dubai, there must be a seamless record of custody, cooling, and transit. Any break in that chain compromises more than quality. It threatens trade relationships, brand reputations, and regulatory standing. And yet, for all the machinery, the sensors, the databases, and certifications, one truth remains unchanged. The product still begins with a line cast into open water. The unpredictability of the sea is always present, lurking beneath every sterile box and printed label. 
No amount of logistics can tame the wildness of the original catch, but what the supply chain offers is a kind of translation, a way to carry that fleeting moment across geography and time. It's not perfection that keeps swordfish moving across borders. It's control, the steady hum of refrigeration, the tight scan of a barcode, the practiced cut of a blade at just the right angle, all playing their part in delivering something that still tastes of salt, of muscle, of deep water stillness. And this orchestration continues because the demand persists. Chefs in Chicago requesting swordfish collars for grill nights, Families in Lima preparing it ceviche-style with lime and red onion. Restaurants in Athens plating it with rosemary and lemon. Each request sends a signal backward through the chain, pulling another box from a reefer, another loin from a crate, another cut from a cold table. All of it wrapped in plastic, coded in digits, yet rooted in something raw and real. A fish that once cut through the ocean with a blade for a face and is now delicately laid on ice ready for yet another set of hands. At first light in Tokyo, crates are wheeled onto wet concrete floors as auctioneers call out prices in clipped bursts. One crate holds swordfish from the South Pacific, caught days ago, now gleaming beneath plastic and ice. It's cut tight, its color a soft, translucent pink. It passes inspection not by luck, but by layers of quiet coordination held at exact temperatures, handled by gloved hands, carried across continents without losing its seaborne stillness. What appears seamless is anything but. Each crate has survived a gauntlet of regulations, inspections and invisible tolerances. It must meet strict legal standards from the species type to the gear used to catch it. A missing code, a misfiled entry, even a slight temperature drift can stop the whole chain. Global demand stretches thin across regions, and with it, expectations grow sharper. In New York, the swordfish must arrive with muscle dense and uniform. In Barcelona, the steaks are expected to sear without shedding excess water. In Seoul, the cut must be sashimi ready, not a fiber too soft. These preferences mean that swordfish isn't shipped in bulk. It's sculpted to spec. Processing plants carve loins with near-surgical precision. Halogen bulbs illuminate flesh as workers assess texture with practiced hands. Gas-flushed packaging replaces oxygen with nitrogen and CO2 to extend shelf life without altering taste. Cold remains constant, but everything else is tailored. Preserving flavor is no longer enough. Today's market demands visibility. A filet in Paris may carry a QR code that traces its route from the Indian Ocean to a warehouse in Lyon. That code verifies catch date, vessel, processor and carrier. It confirms legality, freshness and even sustainability, with growing emphasis on traceable methods. Blockchain platforms now link each handoff from deck to reefer truck, from customs to supermarket shelf. The data is silent, but relentless. If a container from Colombo to Rotterdam fluctuates by even two degrees during transfer, the entire load might be rerouted or refused. Even packaging reflects this shift. Traditional styrofoam boxes are replaced with molded pulp made from sugarcane fiber, layered with leak-proof membranes and lined with bio-based gels that hold temperature for days. Some fish are shipped in crates powered by solar-assisted cooling, designed to reduce reliance on fossil-fueled refrigeration. Others travel with sensors embedded deep within the insulation, transmitting real-time temperature logs via RFID. These silent sentinels turn frozen cargo into measurable data, building trust where margins for error are thin. At customs checkpoints, officials open random crates, slicing into loins to check for ammonia traces or discoloration. If a sample shows signs of histamine buildup, the container may be seized or destroyed. In high-throughput ports like Hamburg or Los Angeles, digital inspections run alongside physical ones. Thermal imaging cameras screen pallets for uneven cooling while inspectors match tags against digital manifests. Any inconsistency is flagged. One misplaced pallet, one wrong cut, and hours of coordination collapse into waste. Despite the complexity, small innovations ripple outward. 
Collagen extracted from swordfish skin now appears in cosmetics. Trimmed scraps are processed into protein meal or turned into rich stock bases for culinary use. Some operations near zero waste, using chilled wastewater from ice production to irrigate nearby crops. In Chile, a pilot program wraps swordfish loins in biodegradable film, printed with harvest data, eliminating paper labeling altogether. And all of it, every scan, every cut, every cooling cycle, exists to preserve something that can't be replaced once it's gone. Not the fish itself, but the sensation it holds, the firmness beneath a knife, the clean brininess that lingers after grilling, the soft resistance as it meets the teeth. Swordfish moves not as a commodity, but as an experience waiting to be protected. Each time it crosses a border, it carries with it the labor of dozens, the scrutiny of censors, and the quiet pressure of expectation. And when it finally reaches the plate, still cold, still intact, it offers no hint of the distance behind it, only the illusion of having never left the sea. What melts on your tongue began in salt water, preserved by cold, tracked by code, and trusted across borders. Proof that behind each clean slice is a world moving with quiet precision.